Thank you for everyone being here today in person and uh, I think we've got a number of people that are online with us as well. So uh, look, I will start off by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the Ngunnawal people and the Ngambri people, the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet here today. And I'd like to pay my respects to their past uh, elders and their emerging as well. Uh, and please welcome to those who the, the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islanders of whom may be present here today. So I'm going to be short and brief because I really want to make sure that we give the, uh, the floor to some wonderful guests that we have here today. But to introduce myself, my name is Ebony Aiken. I am the Government Affairs uh, Representative for Nokia across Asia, Pacific and Japan. And I have the pleasure today of being able to not only introduce Leslie Shannon, um, who is Nokia's uh, Global Head of Innovation and Trend Scouting. Um, she's flown here all the way from the US to talk to us around the future trends, um, particularly into our interconnected realities and the metaverse and really what sits behind that technology here today. Most importantly, we have a panel of guests here today and I thank the Australian Academy of Science, um, their CEO, Anna Maria, who will be joining our panel today to talk about the role of women in STEM. Uh, we also have the pleasure of having um, Scarlett McDermott here from the Tech Council of Australia, many of whom are probably aware they're doing a huge amount of work in our space, uh, a very important role around tech jobs, but also, again, the role that women can play within this um, fantastic um, industry that we're all part of. So um, Nokia ourselves, um, I will give a shout out to Amanda, who runs our Stronger Her um, program within Nokia, and it's really all about championing women um, within the tech industry, within our own branch here at Nokia. It's something we're really, really, really focused on and really proud of. It's about how can we encourage not only females, but diversity into the tech industry. It's an exciting place to be. It's gonna to touch every part of our lives, whether it's now and into the future. And so how can we share the story around what we're seeing globally, but also how can we encourage that next generation as well? So before we do kick off on the panel of questions, uh, I would like to introduce the lovely Le Leslie Shannon um, to give a quick presentation on what we mean when we talk about interconnected realities and the metaverse. So Leslie, please come up. Lovely, thank you so much, Ebony. And, and welcome to everyone. I'm very, very pleased to be here. You can hear from my voice that I am, you know, was born in the United States, but I actually did emigrate to Australia in the mid 90s, and I am an Australian citizen. I began working for Nokia here in Australia back in um, 2000. Um, but then in 2004, I went to um, work at Nokia headquarters in Finland, and I ended up marrying my boss, and he's Finnish, and so I accidentally re-emigrated. So I'm just like looking for a reason to come back. But the last um, eight years or so, I've actually been in California in Silicon Valley, and I've been working in this role as head of trend and innovation scouting for Nokia. And so what that means is I'm specifically looking, uh, you know, we're in the network business, and so I'm specifically looking for innovations that are happening in other industries that have some kind of telecommunications connectivity component to it, and making sure that these other industries, which quite often have no telco knowledge whatsoever, um, that their expectations with what they're building is actually something that our networks are meeting. And, and so I kind of self-appointed myself to do this role. Um, I'm, I'm a very firm promoter of women in tech, and I'm particularly a firm promoter of, uh, I mean, obviously, since I am one, but um, uh, women not being afraid that if perhaps they don't have a technical degree, then they can't be in tech. I have um, an undergraduate degree in neuroanatomy and a graduate degree in the history of art. And here I am doing tech work because you know what? The history of art taught me how to analyze things in a nonlinear way. So there's many ways that women and others can come into the tech world and be insightful and be valuable. You don't always have to be an engineer. So I like to throw that idea out there too. So let me go ahead and, um, and get started. Let me show you what it is that I'm seeing. Um, now, the word metaverse, I'm going to start there. Um, uh, and when people, when I say the word metaverse, Quite often what people imagine are, are these kinds of worlds. Three-dimensional immersive digital worlds where I'm an avatar and you're an avatar and we're interacting with each other in real time. And, and yeah, that's, these are you know, valid metaverse worlds, um, but they're actually quite limited. The um, problem with all of them is that 
to be in this fully immersive di digital world, you have to be ignoring the physical world. And that's something we're, we just can't do that all day, every day. You know, at some point we have to take off the headset or shut the PC and, and go make dinner. <laughs> you know, and so, um, uh, so, so for me, these kinds of highly immersive uh, worlds, and I include gaming worlds in here too, they are, they're more like going to a movie theater in that they can be spectacularly transformational experiences and wonderful experiences. And in these worlds, you can meet people from all over the world, but that's not where we're gonna be spending our life. It's not where we're gonna be spending our time. Um, and so before I kind of look at where this is, so, so yes, these exist, and I know this is what people think of when they think of the word metaverse, but the reality is that the actual metaverses that are doing good and that are changing lives right now are actually happening much more in enterprise settings and will long term with augmented reality integrated with our physical world. So, so let me tell you what is happening in these spaces and where we're going with this. So one problem with the whole metaverse conversation is that people are throwing that word around and they don't really talk about it in a very concrete way. So I wanna talk about it in a concrete way right here. And so the most concrete way you can get is to by looking at what is the hardware that people are using to access these worlds. And so if we look at each row as a different kind of flavor of the metaverse and look at the hardware that people are using to access uh, these worlds on uh, and these experiences on, it actually consumer VR headset is only for some of these. And the reality is that even businesses that began with the full-time consumer VR headset, you know, only business model, there's just not that many people using VR headsets. VR headsets are lovely, they're wonderful. I personally do all my fitness in VR, and so I love them dearly. But again, it cuts you off from the physical world when you put them on, so you're not gonna live your life there. And so companies that started with things there, they've had to add PC clients, they've had to add smartphone clients, they've had to add gaming console clients in order to draw, reach a wider audience. And so, so the fact that um, the metaverse is actually experienced over PC and over smartphones and tablets um, is actually a really significant thing to understand about this. Now, I, I, so that first slide kind of covered those first three rows. And then if we look at the enterprise and the virtual reality, sorry, the enterprise virtual reality and the enterprise augmented reality worlds, I'm gonna show some examples of those. This is where we have still the hardware of the PC and um, uh, the consumer VR headsets, but we also have um, specialized enterprise devices. And these areas are very well developed and they're flourishing today. These are not technologies of tomorrow, they're, they're technologies of today. But then down here, the last row, the consumer augmented reality, I'm including that even though you might not think of that as kind of metaverse, and, and to be true, it's not. Because what we're really talking about here are Snapchat and Instagram lenses and filters. And the reason that I include these in our thinking about the metaverse is that even though these are really metaverse adjacent, they are training an entire generation of people to get used to and to expect and to enjoy having a digital overlay onto their visual physical world. In fact, I have a, a, a dear friend who, um, I meet her in Zoom calls all the time, and she always just looks so fabulous. She's really beautifully put together. And I found she's always using these kind of like subtle makeup filters in Zoom. It's like, God, no wonder she can look good no matter what time of day, man. And so, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're getting used to that kind of stuff. But anyway, this is this training ground, this kind of on-ramp training wheels to the full metaverse experience. Really, it's this, lower box, this little TBD, of the consumer head-mounted eyeglasses form factor device that doesn't exist yet, but we're expecting this to come in the second half of this decade. HTC has said that they expect their first commercial product to be around 2027, um, uh, and, and so, so, and the first one will, will, you know, will still be experimental, so we're really looking towards the end of this decade for consumer eyeglass form factor augmented reality headsets to come out. And the reason this is important, the reason we really think there is going to be a there there, is that new technologies only take off when they solve a problem. And so 
for the enterprise ones, the reason these things are here today is that it's okay to put a big, heavy, clunky thing on your head to do a specific task for a limited amount of time. But you're not gonna wear them out, especially if they're not fashion forward and light and not hot and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of physics problems that need to be solved before we can actually get to having functionality in this thing that a lot of us are already putting on our heads on a daily basis. I'm looking at people with glasses right now in the audience. Um, and um, because the problem that this solves is this. It's the fact that our computing right now is locked behind a two-dimensional screen. Whether it's a laptop or a smartphone, what it's doing is it's taking our gaze, it's hijacking our gaze from looking at the actual physical world and the people in it and looking at a two-dimensional screen instead. And, and it actually had an experience with my colleague, Andrew. We drove down here from Sydney in a rental car and Andrew was, was doing the driving and um, his ordinary car has a heads-up display. The rental car did not. He was like, he has gotten used to the heads-up display and having the information just readily available there in his visual field all the time. And, I won't say you were complaining every five minutes, but it was close. <laughs> and, and he's like, I get it, I get it. When you actually have that experience of having the information and entertainment we're currently turning to our smartphones to provide, and by the way, it also steals a hand. I've lost a hand now. To be able to have that integrated with our view as we move through our physical world, reconnecting visually with the people and the places that we you know, are in. That's, people are going to enjoy that once they have that experience. But for that to happen, the computing has got to come off of the device because that means it gets lighter, the battery lasts longer, all kinds of other things, and it needs to go into the network. And it's solving that problem is why Nokia, why we're interested in this. I don't want you coming away from this saying, oh, I saw this AR VR presentation from Nokia, so they're clearly gonna be building VR headsets. No, we are not, just to make that clear. We are interested in the network and the architectural changes in the network that this new computing is going to bring. And so, so, <clears throat> So when we look at the connectivity that's required behind this, um, uh, these new hardwares, right now it's all Wi-Fi, all Wi-Fi. Because, um, uh, and if you're dealing with the stuff on your phone, then it's the existing mobile network. Let me get this, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Because VR in particular, it happens deep indoors. Um, you don't go walking around the street with a VR headset on. And because you do VR indoors, that's a really bad Venn diagram overlay with where 5G is available. And so, so there's no native VR headsets that have 5G. However, for enterprise use cases, there are sometimes when, sometimes when Wi-Fi works just fine, or 4G. But there are times when you do need 5G indoors or outdoors to be able to use the particular uh, Wi-Fi use case, and I'm gonna show you, uh, sorry, the enterprise use case, and I'm gonna show you a couple of those. And there we're really looking at private wireless. And so the elements that we see when somebody needs to use private wireless as opposed to Wi-Fi in an enterprise setting is if they're getting any kind of a feed from a, a camera that's throwing off a lot of data. So HD or a 360 degree camera, or a 360 degree HD camera. That's too much data for Wi-Fi, and so, so that, needs, that needs 5G. If you are doing something where you are taking remote actions, and so you need to have very low latency and reliability, when I press this button, then that happens over there, and I need for there to be no delay. Again, Wi-Fi best effort networks, not good enough. You need the guaranteed low latency of 5G. And then the third one is security. You also, you know, if you don't want some high schooler sitting in your parking lot hacking into your robot controls, you know, you really want to have like a lockdown communications network, and that's 5G again rather than Wi-Fi. But then where we actually see all this going is that for the, um, in the future, there we go, um, for the tomorrow's mobile, um, having the low latency and understanding the requirements for having that computing sitting in the network and still relating to the headset, um, that we're actually currently working with other companies, including Qualcomm, to develop the standards for 6G. And we're using a lot of the what's gonna be needed to make this glasses thing happen um, and feeding that into the 6G standard development that's happening right now. Um, but just to, and just to kind of give a hint of how many people are using each one of these kind of areas today, 
This is an orders of magnitude estimate, because that's as good as I can get. And so it's kind of number of zeros after the leading digit, whatever the leading digit is. And so you can see that the metaverse experiences right now are really dominated by gamers and people with smartphones, which is not actually what you tend to think of. Um, but the enterprise world, you know, this kind of steady use here in the middle, it's not a huge amount of people that are using enterprise and augmented reality um, headsets because it's still very early um, for this industry. But I'll show you some of these use cases and I'll show you the results they're getting. Uh, this is a super promising area that we're really excited about. But of course, the big shift that's going to happen again towards the end of this uh, uh, end of this decade is this people shifting from accessing everything on their phones to accessing things through their glasses. And that's kind of, you know, the, the big headline that we're trying to prepare for um, right now. So let's, let's start with a couple of examples, um, of just two examples here from the enterprise world, one of virtual reality and one of augmented reality. And so the first one is, um, actually, I just really know there are two virtual reality examples, forgive me. Um, but this is training. Training has been a huge thing in virtual reality that has really taken off because the utility is so obvious. It doesn't take a whole lot of arm twisting to make people understand that VR training is really good. Because when you do, when you do VR training, you, you, know, you create an environment in which the person who's doing the training, A, doesn't have to travel in order to encounter the equipment. B, they can do the training on their own time again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And if you're dealing with difficult or dangerous situations, they can model these in the digital world safely. And so, so one example, um, this is Varsila, they're a, um, a Finnish shipbuilding company. And so they've worked with the Turku um, University of Applied Sciences to build VR training for ship's captains to be able to model really difficult and dangerous situations. So, you know, teaching the ship captain what to do when the winds are high and there's a ship in the way and there's containers floating in the water. How do you bring the ship into port safely? So, so you know, clear utility here, so they build it. it yes, it turns out to be great, but th what they found that they didn't expect is that because this is digital, you can measure what the person is doing all the time, and you can understand how many microseconds between actions, and you can understand, you can you know, see them when they freeze within decision. You can capture that too. These are things that are much harder to capture if it were a, you know, a, three, a, sorry, a physical mock-up. And so what Varsila discovered is that there's some combinations of catastrophic events that make people, almost everybody, just really badly freak out and then either completely freeze or make a mistake. And so they've been able to take the findings from this training and feed that back into their bridge design so they can minimize the likelihood of people making a mistake and help guide them to prevent them, you know, to, to coax them through the total freeze up phase. And so it turns out this is a really good design testing mechanism um, in, in addition to a really good training mechanism. So, you know, this running what if scenarios in digital twins, a lot of companies are coming into this, you know, the VR world through training and they're discovering it's actually a really good digital twin what if scenario generator. So, you know, and, and one thing that's actually really fantastic is that we're seeing when all of these new technologies come in, um, it's, the focus is not on the technology. What happens is the work life gets better for the human beings. That's, that's really the net net that we see out of all of this. But then here's an example that actually specifically uses 5G. And basically anything with teleoperations uh, truly needs 5G in the enterprise space. And so, so this is Sarcos Robotics. They're an American company based in Salt Lake City. They build exoskeletons. So usually this human being is strapped into this giant robot kind of thing that lets them pick up heavy things with superhuman powers. But turns out you maybe don't always want to be strapped into the device that's lifting, oh, I don't know, explosives or heavily corrosive chemicals. And so in this case, they put a 360 degree camera where the human head would be and then use 5G, because Wi-Fi can't carry that much traffic in real time, to bring that feed to the person who is standing a safe distance away, which is not shown here, <laughs> but anyway, somewhere far further away than that, with a VR headset so they can feel that they are genuinely there driving the robot. And then they can be using the controls natively, just, you know, 
this is how it feels like I'm, you know, I'm moving this stuff. But then the latency needs to be super low so that there's no serious lag between pressing the button and actually moving the robot, because that could be dangerous. And then the third element, as I mentioned, is, you know, the safety, making sure that, you know, you're not getting hacked into by some kid sitting in the parking lot with a, you know, who's out for a laugh and wants to take over, you know, industrial robots for fun. Um, yeah, so 5G has the security on that that Wi-Fi doesn't. And so, you know, we at Nokia, we did a study with Ernst & Young, sorry, EY, they've rebranded, um, uh, on the industrial metaverse and the benefits of it. And if you're interested in this topic at all, I really do recommend it. Our guys did a great job with the survey and they asked a lot of um, really fabulous questions. But here's, here's, you know, we were looking at um, heavy industry largely. And so, um, so we made a distinction between companies that were, had already launched either augmented or virtual reality um, uh, 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 situations in their in their business and then ones that were still just thinking about it and then at the end we kind of rolled everything up and across all AR and VR implementations and there's a lot of different ones what we found is that this dark bars those are the companies that are thinking about implementing um, these solutions over the next 12 months but they haven't done anything yet and then the the lighter colored bars are the ones the companies that have already launched things and what you see in the case of all of these business benefits when you ask companies that haven't done it yet what kind of business benefits do you expect to get out of your augmented or virtual reality solutions and it's lower than the results when you ask the companies what did you get when you did implement these things? This technology, as new and as young as it is, it is exceeding um, expectations in every single case and delivering much higher business results for the companies that have the courage to implement them. And, and one thing that, that I'm finding, at least right now, because these are such early technologies, is that the companies that are implementing them it tends to be one lone brave soul who has enough budget power and enough, um, you know, or just power power within the organization to make it happen, darn it. And, and so this is like such a no-brainer because it's really a you can't lose situation. So for those of you who are thinking about being the brave soul in your organizations, go for it. You're really not going to be able to lose. I said so. <laughs> so. But let's shift quickly to the consumer um, side because this is going to be the one that, that you know, really affects all of us. And so the question is, what kind of thing would make people put an actual computer on their heads on a daily basis, especially if they're not already eyeglass wearers? And, and it seems to me that um, because you know, eyeglasses are, they're close to your eyes, they're close to your ears, some kind of sensory enhancement is very likely to be the key initial thing that gets us to start putting these devices on our heads. And then if we look at the way that mobile phones developed, the first mobile phones only made phone calls. But enough of us started carrying phones that over time they developed the techno, the, the cost came down, the size came down, the functionality came up, and they slowly morphed from being enterprise devices, as we see today, into consumer devices. And, and so this, is a, um, this was from a video that Google uh, released last year. Google is not, they've just recently announced they're not gonna be producing AR hardware, so this is not gonna come from them, but the use case is still instructive. Subtitles for everyday life, you know? Just being able to, you know, we, this is, you know, so the, the, this is the clips from a video. So the woman here, the Google person has handed her a pair of glasses, no wires connected to it all, normal looking glasses, she puts them on, and then he says, you should be able to start seeing what I'm saying. And then she is seeing the words that he's saying appear in real time as he's saying them. And what is happening is we're getting the audio feed is being captured by the glasses. And it's being sent, in this case, probably to the smartphone. And it's doing a speech to text translation. And it's bringing it back to appear as subtitles in the woman's field of view. But of course, Google has translate assets as well. So the man there, he's speaking English. And the person wearing the glasses is getting Spanish. And so that kind of thing, oh my gosh, next time I go someplace like Japan, absolutely hand me those glasses. I would wear those in a flash. So the utility, like sensory enhancement, the utility of that kind of thing is unquestionable. And so it's the find the use cases with the greatest utility that you don't have to explain. I think that sort of thing is going to be the path into the consumer world. But then, um, and so, so this for me, is where the true metaverse is going to be. This is a, um, a, a concept drawing by Niantic, which is the Pokemon Go company. And their ver version of the metaverse is very much this one. It's the, I am 
in my environment, whether I'm indoors or outdoors, wherever I am, I am seeing the virtual, <laughs> the actual reality of the physical world around me with very light touches of digital helpfulness that I have decided I want to see in terms of navigation or something entertaining, you know, perhaps, you know, I, I, Barbie is like appearing, like every room is going to have a Barbie hidden in it and I get to look for, you know, whatever. That's going to be completely weak. It's going to change the nature of our relationship from between humans and computers if this stuff is integrated into the way that we see the world. And we will necessarily have to be in complete control of it. Um, <laughs> the MIT Media Lab, which has been working in augmented reality for a decade or more, they've come up with guidelines. You know, so instead of like this apocalyptic kind of view that you know, there's some videos on YouTube of like advertisements and stuff coming at you all the time and discounts and like, oh my God. The MIT Media Lab guidelines are, first of all, no digital content below the waist because that obscures the floor and that's dangerous. Then for everything up above, digital obscuring your visual field, only 15% of your digital field, of your visual field, sorry, maximum, only 15% of the time, maximum. Light touch, light touch, because otherwise we go insane. <laughs> and, so, and obviously also only content that you yourself have selected. So, I mean, it's, it's, this for me is truly the metaverse. But wait, there's more, because generative AI is actually coming into this. And those of us in the XR world, we fully expect XR to be the primary interface into generative AI. And this is a possibility uh, of how this might work is demonstrated by these. This is just a bunch of Stanford students. Just a few months after ChatGPT came out, they just kind of were messing around and they came up with this and they just posted it on Twitter. So what they've done here is, um, They've, they've taken this, um, uh, this monocle, this AR monocle from Brilliant Labs. It just clicks on to normal glasses. And then what they're doing, they're just sitting in a Starbucks, but they're <laughs> mimicking a job interview situation. So the guy that we can see there, he's the job interviewer, and he's asking questions. The monocle is doing an audio capture and then doing speech to text, then sending that text into ChatGPT, and then asking ChatGPT to come back with what the response should be from the interviewee, and then that's appearing as what he should say, AR, that he can then read off and then give that answer. Now, this starts, okay, so this is a funny example, and, um, you know, fine, and, and, but most of us, you know, to be honest, we're not gonna be walking around reading what a computer tells us to say all the time. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying, the message is here. The, just the demonstration of this, though, the key with generative AI is the natural language interface into computing resources. So being able to offer natural language interface, i.e. anybody can use their words and, gener and really interface with some deep computing. That is the, sh the significant change that is happening here. And there are many other products that OpenAI, the company has, um, and you know, and obviously much, many more to come, but one of them right now is called Point E, where you can use natural language to describe a digital thing that you would like to see appear in three dimensions in your space. And so put this together, you know, with the glasses and everything, and now you can say, okay, glasses, um, generate for me an evil clown sitting in the front row here. You know, I don't, sorry, I don't know why I would do that, but, um, but, but the ability to actually craft and shape the way that you want your world to look like to you, that's the kind of, you know, at a whim, that's the kind of power that's gonna be available. Another thing that um, ChatGPT, or sorry, that OpenAI has is a program called Codex, which has been out there for a couple of years, that does computer programming. So you just describe in natural language the computer program that you would like to see. And, and you know, and, and they actually, and then the pro, then uh, Codex actually goes out and selects the best language to write the program in, and then it writes the language. So imagine, you know, and kind of putting a couple of these things together, you know, it just kind of comes to you. In fact, the Barbie thing did just come to me. Like, hey, glasses, every time I walk into a new environment, create a life-sized Barbie and hide it somewhere and I need to find it. You know, th th this is the kind of stuff that is going to be possible. And, um, you know, so that one, that one takes a pretty sophisticated understanding of the physical layout of your space. And this is also the kind of stuff that we're looking at. There's a lot of mapping that's involved with all of it. But the ability for the average person to interact with 
seriously large amounts of computing and processing on a daily basis, on a hands-free basis, as they move through the space. That's really where we see things going. This is absolutely gigantic, and it really truly means a fundamental shifting of the way that we encounter and that we use digital and computing resources in our daily lives, not just at work, but at home as well. And so there's a lot to figure out and to unpack with all of this and, and legislation and regulation that will need to be created around all of it. So we're all gonna be busy over the next decade. And, and, so, and so, but the, the biggest change that we see, just kind of bringing it back just to the network is that we see um, you know, things going out up here with new devices and then connecting to new computing that is sitting in the network and the question, uh, and then services that sit on those for the AR, the VR, the whatever. And who owns those, um, those, those new servers? It's gonna be a mishmash, what the business models look like, um, who is responsible, who is responsible for the security, the privacy, um, all of these really important questions. These are the things that we're going to be unpacking over the next decade as we all work together. And so, so and with that, um, thank you very much for your time, and I think it's time to have a conversation. <laughs> thank you so much, Leslie. Um, and on that note, I will invite our other panelists to come to the stage. So, Anna Maria, the CEO from the Australian Academy of Science. Uh, as well as the lovely Scarlett McDonough for Tech Council. Now, I am going to kick straight off into questions because I want to make sure we get as much of this fabulous panel that we, we have um, in front of us. And I think we can all um, agree that it's wonderful to have such incredible female representation um, for our industry, but also across the academic um, portfolio as well. Um, now look, I'm going to kick off with the obvious question because I think everybody looks at this and goes, oh my god, technology and there's all of this amazing emerging um, technology that's coming in our future, but like what does that mean for me as an individual? What does that mean for me as a, as a job? And I think, you know, there's a huge amount of opportunity and I think a message that I've heard from yourself, Leslie, is we don't need to be scared. Um, so I'm going to ask you the obvious question before I go into our, um, our other panellists, which is, you know, what is the impact going to be? Or more importantly, what do you think are the opportunities that are going to be with the metaverse in terms of digital schools of the future? That was a lot of questions wrapped up into one there, Ebony, but uh, <laughs> um, in terms of the workforce and the workplace, there's two really main threads that I see. One is that um, we actually had a session um, at NBN last week and we were dealing, and we talked to um, the New South Wales head of the Manu Advanced Manufacturing Association. And there were a lot of other advanced manufacturing um, people there. And the message that we got from them loud and clear is something that I've heard other places, but it was really nice to hear it directly from them, which is, Automation and you know bringing in robots and digitization into the workplace that is something that quite often makes people fear for their jobs, but they have all they all said you know we have not seen that because the short form of what happens is automation leads to greater efficiency, greater efficiency leads to business growth, business growth leads to new hiring, and so all three of them you know were saying we have all seen it automation hiring not automation leads to loss of jobs. And so that was, that was really nice to hear that from them directly. Then the other, um, the other thing kind of more as us as individual workers, one of the things that's happening in the United States, and I'm sorry for not being across how this is happening in Australia, but school districts, some school districts are really freaking out and they're um, banning uh, the use of ChatGPT in classrooms. Um, I personally, and this is a personal view of mine, this is not a Nokia statement here, <laughs> um, I personally think that's a mistake because crafting prompts, uh, for me, ChatGPT, it's like the, it's the equivalent of um, the pocket calculator. When I was in high school in the 70s, yeah, 70s, um, the pocket calculator, affordable pocket calculator was just coming out and everybody's freaking about, out about concluding it in your calculus or your physics classes. And, um, and so now they're just realizing, okay, that releases people from the grunt work and now they can focus on the higher value tasks. ChatGPT is exactly the same thing, just for language. And, and so, so school districts that actually say, no, we don't want our children doing this because it might be plagiarizing, it might not be thinking. Yes, you're going to have to reconfigure how it gets used and what the questions you're asking are, but the children who are the skilled prompt crafters are going to be the ones who are the most employable 
in the future. And if you yourself also are personally not using generative AI, you are at risk of losing your job to someone who is using generative AI. So sorry, that came out quite dark, but, <laughs> but it's, re it's really about opportunity and about sanding away the, the grunt work and letting us focus on the really truly value add. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I might actually hand to Anna Maria on that, uh, on that question off the back of that one, just in, in terms of STEM and, and academia that sits behind it, you know, what, what do we need to do or what do you see that we need to do as an industry to really get behind and encourage STEM, particularly in the women? in the women in the industry space. Absolutely, so when, when you mentioned opportunities before, I saw a workforce development opportunity here and you touched on it, Leslie, in terms of having uh, the opportunity of creating more pathways, really exciting pathways for younger people um, to use those um, incredibly important skills that they're learning going through, through school. Uh, but it really does uh, mean that we need to redouble our efforts around uh, giving children those um, science, technology, engineering and math skills that they need to build on and how that interfaces with the technical world where they will increasingly be applying them. But beyond that opens up pathways that they haven't yet imagined. I think we're all fond of saying to younger people that they're, they're likely to be in jobs that they don't know exist yet. And the more we hear presentations like this, it seems very, very obvious that that's the case. But again, that, that's an opportunity. Uh, you also spoke earlier around um, uh, um, the school bans around uh, uh, generative AI. Uh, we've seen one of the first actions in academia um, in Australia where the Australian Research Council, it's one of our funding councils, has banned the use of generative AI to assess grant applications. Um, now that was probably a very... Not, not, sorry, yeah. not, not to create but to assess? To assess. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that is actually one of these dare I say, knee-jerk reactions in the absence of a broader regulatory framework. So that's currently being developed and something that Australia faces as a challenge um, and that will very much help guide decision making by uh, all sorts of organisations including in academia. In all of that, um, we absolutely need those workforces and those efforts to be informed by diverse thinking. Uh, so if we don't have uh, a diversity of decision makers and developers uh, within that, that pipeline, um, we do very much risk uh, embedding biases into our products and our thinking and our decision making. We already know that um, ChatGPT has some biases built into it and can only be built upon if that's the sort of information that's going into the system. I challenge you to Google the top CEOs of the world and I think you get nine out of ten of them who are men. Um, so these things are still there and that's what um, the machines have learned so far. So we do have a collective effort to ensure right from the early stages in primary school, right through the pipeline, that we have diversity in that thinking. Uh, um, fantastic segue um, into our representative um, Scarlett here from the Tech Council. I mean, I think you guys in, the, in yourselves have a, a very large and ambitious goal um, in the tech sector when it comes to, to jobs. And, you know, I think going back to Anna Maria's point around, uh, and even Leslie's point around the ecosystem, I mean, you guys and yourselves are playing a huge role, and I've heard you quite often talk about, um, you know, tech jobs. It's not just going to be traditional tech jobs in the tech sector. <laughs> every, every industry is going to have an element of tech. So from your standpoint, you know, what, what do you guys see as your role in terms of representing the tech sector? And, and, and I guess what do you see in terms of encouragement for women in, in the industry in particular? Thanks, Ebony. And you can tell this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about and I speak regularly about our goal of 1.2 million workers in technology in Australia by 2030. But it's not just about straight numbers of people that you have working in an industry. Composition of our workforce is more important than it's ever been. And I think what we're seeing here is a great kind of carry on of, of what we saw in early facial recognition technologies. Mm -hmm where there was a strong reflection of the teams that were involved in designing and building those systems uh, that we saw when they rolled out to the general public and we saw that the recognition of people of colour and the recognition particularly of women of colour uh, was a drastic drop-off rate because those people were not included in the design and the build of those technologies and the testing. So when we're looking at the technology workforce and we're coming up against emerging technologies like um, augmented reality and interconnected realities, we're going to see a bigger and bigger impact on day-to-day -day life of these systems, particularly if we're looking at AI systems that are involved in decision-making. 
So we need to ensure that when we're building these technologies, right from the outset, that we've got the most diverse and representative of our population teams that we could possibly build. And I was really encouraged, Leslie, to hear you talk about your own background in art. Uh, it's such an important thing to recognise that it's not just technology that we're building here. We're asking social questions. You know, when we're talking about if you do augment somebody's job role, what do they do with the rest of their time? It's a great scenario when that makes your company more productive and you can do more of the things that you're great at. But there will be scenarios where there are jobs that we decide as a society we can do better with machines or we can do better with computing. Um, and so we do have to examine what is our responsibility when people are impacted in that way. How can we reskill them into technology? And so a lot of what we're doing is working on pathways for reskillers. Um, and you know, we do see that women in the majority come into technology later in their career rather than straight out of graduating high school or college. So we're looking at how can we make sure that we're building systems of employment and systems of education that are inclusive by design so that we can ensure that the end output in technology is representative of our population as well. Thanks, Scarlett. Um, and I think what you've also just identified is, you know, we've, we've, we, we definitely have uh, an immense amount of opportunity, but there's challenges at kind of either ends of the spectrum, you know, encouraging um, that newer generation into the workforce to get excited about technology. Um, you know, Leslie, I might throw to you as well, because I think one of the other, um, I guess, challenges we're also seeing is how do we encourage younger people into other areas um, of, of industry that may not be tech focused, but you've then also got the challenge of um, embedding digitisation into traditional technology. So I might even get you to touch on what we learnt and what came out of the, um, the session that we had, um, particularly on advanced manufacturing and what came out of that only from a, from a digitisation and the challenges as well. <clears throat> yeah, so um, one of the challenges globally with more traditional kind of heavy industry, so logistics and manufacturing, is that young people today, they see these and they go, uh, no, thank you. I am not interested in a career in that. That's not sexy or exciting at all. And, and this is just right around the world. And, and so... And so, like, for example, UPS, uh, which is a parcel delivery service in the United States, they're actually looking at using a lot of VR training and a lot of AR kind of package picking kind of things to, to train drivers and to attract, specifically to attract younger people into the workforce. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, uh, there's a there's a government body in Finland where you know Nokia is Finnish, and so we're tied into a lot of the, all things Finland, um, called uh, VTT, and they are uh, you know promoting Finnish technology in um, uh, as many ways and looking at new business opportunities for Finnish technologies, and. Um, I know what you asked me to talk about, and I'm now going to talk about something completely different, but I'll come back to what you were <laughs> trying to guide me towards. Um, one of the concepts that VTT has come up with is the idea of a super janitor. So right now, they're having a hard time finding people to be, you know, building custodians, because that's a, you know, uninteresting job. And so the people who have them are generally you know, just older and they're having a hard time bringing young people in there. So VTT's super janitor concept is the idea that <clears throat> you are the custodian of a building for everything. And if something goes wrong with the elevator, instead of calling the elevator, sorry, the lift, the lift uh, manufacturing people and having them send out a service person, instead you put on your AR headset and now someone from the lift company talks you through the actual repairing of the lift. And then the next day, it's the, the heating and air conditioning system. And you're the one who's actually doing that. So it's always challenging, always exciting, always changing. And, and so that bringing it, making it a higher skilled, higher paid, much more interesting job where you're interfacing with the experts from multiple industries rather than just being the guy who opens the door. So these kinds of rethinking of the roles and the way that you can re shape the roles and recast them to make them more interesting to people all over. That's the kind of stuff that, that I think we're going to see a lot of. But the where, where I think you were referring to was um, one of the things that we've realized with the rise of generative AI is that there's this problem with accessing your data and understanding the messages that your data has for you for, in your corporation or in your government or whatever. Because all the data, it's in the systems, and the people who are able, who have the skills to query the systems and to, to write the, like, I'm going to find out 
the patterns and stuff. It's the data scientists. And I love me a good data scientist. However, they are not the people in the front lines who are dealing with the customers or who are delivering the packages or whatever. They don't know the business problems in a deep, profound way that the people who are in the front lines do. And so there's this unintentional air gap that happens in every entity between the ability to query your data and the people who have who understand the right queries to ask. And generative AI, by putting the ability to link into deep computer queries in natural language, bridges that gap. And that is going to be a super powerful transformative thing that we're going to see across all industry. And so, so, and so that means that that, that kind of demarcation of what's a tech job and what's not a tech job, it, that, divi that division, I think, is going to slowly melt away. Because we're going to get to where everybody, you know, even the guy working the drive through at McDonald's, he's going to be able to, or she is going to be able to say, like, oh, I saw this weird pattern. Like, on Tuesdays, they tend, everybody orders pancakes. You know, I don't know what. And, and it's like, hey, is this actually a real thing? And they can ask the system and get it back. And like, hey, hey, manager, maybe we should put pancakes at the top of the menu on Tuesdays. You know, these kinds of insights will become queryable, verifiable, and much more instantly actionable by people in the front lines. And, and you know, we only, the saying is, we only label things technology when they're new and weird. And so, like, a toaster is no longer considered technology, you know, but it used to be. And so it's going to be incorporating these big data superpowers into everybody's day-to-day -day stuff. It's not going to really seem like technology, you know, by the end of the decade, I think. Thanks, Leslie. Um, and I think, you know, coming back to this point around the, the challenges and opportunities that we, we have in the sector and the fact that it isn't just going to be in the tech, tech, tech sector where we see jobs, you know, Anna Maria might go back to you and say, you know, what should we be thinking about, you know, in terms of a framework or a guide to, I guess, encourage, um, because we know it's going to start at grassroots, but what do we need to do, you know, from an academic standpoint to encourage a framework or what might it look like? I might answer that um, through the lens of diversity and inclusion as well. And then I actually have like four questions. If you want to ask me. I don't know if that's allowed as panellists, but I'll save them for later. Um, uh, but um, we do need a framework to enable all of the available talent to put their energy, intellect, time and resources into this future and into shaping this future. And they're not all STEM people. They're a range of, of people across our workforce. History of art, history of art. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, if I look at um, some of the work we've done at looking at the future needs of the space industry and the skills there, sure, there's some technical skills, but a lot of it is not. Um, actually, a lot, most of it is not. Um, uh, I, I digress, though. So, um, in 2019, the Academy of Science, in partnership with the Academy of Technology and Engineering, put together a 10-year plan to attract um, women into STEM. You could really take women and put diversity more broadly into that frame um, so as to achieve gender equity by 2030. Um, and there's an entire framework, I guess, scaffold around which we can achieve this. So, firstly, it seeks to remove the multiple barriers that um, women in STEM uh, face, and they start from primary school and go right through throughout their careers, um, but it's built around an attract, uh, retain and progress framework. So how do we get people in uh, into, the, into the sector from whatever background they might be in, retain them there because we keep losing uh, very critical people in this um, workforce um, and then progress them through exciting opportunities. So that frame I think is a really useful one for um, not just removing those barriers but for workforce retention and the, the sort of diversity we've got um, within the skill set needed and within the people we need to drive that. Um, uh, I guess also to answer that question, I'm going to answer it with a bit of a question. I wanted to ask you, Leslie, what you consider the basic science disciplines uh, that we need to be nurturing more of to answer some of the questions to get to 6G and to get to uh, the things you've been talking about. Is it is it the basic skills of physics? Um, is it the basic skill, uh, acknowledging that arts and a range of other skills are needed, but the, the technology challenge, um, the connectivity challenge, the network challenge, what, what do we need there? Yeah, I think one of the, um, again, going back to generative AI, being able to use natural language to be able to interact with really large-scale computing. Again, this is me speaking and not Nokia. Um, 
I don't know if like learning coding is actually going to be as important as it was mm -hmm. even last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you don't need to code, like it's like I I used to I used to run a mean DOS line, but <laughs> haven't done that for a while. <laughs> and so um, the the places that I'm seeing the problem is there's actually a poor mix. Uh, between the way that the academics have kind of divided up subjects and the way that um, uh, new technologies are actually using these things. And so thinking specifically about the areas that I know the most, you know, the augmented and the virtual reality worlds, it's um, being able to do three-dimensional scanning of a place, being able to um, synthesize data in a new way, being able to visually represent things. And so there's, there's graphics and there's physics and there's spectrum, and it's really a little across multiple do domains. And we don't, we're not really structured that way. We're structured where you are a physicist and you are a chemist and you are a computer programmer. Um, and yet these new jobs are very, um, they're, they're, they're syntheses, <laughs> syntheses. <laughs> And, uh, and so I, I, you know, I don't mean throw it all out and start all over again, but multidisciplinary, encouraging multiple, uh, there's some really, not, especially in service of virtual and augmented reality. There's many universities that I've been working with in the States, um, University of Maryland, Florida International University, they're creating undergraduate degrees for um, programming. Uh, and so it's, it's half computer programming and half computer visual design, and another half, that's all I have, uh, game design, and so again, multidisciplinary. So I think fundamentally that's, I might yeah. just add to that for a moment because I think yeah. we don't hear enough about the vocational education sector in technology, and there's a really big opportunity as we move to these sort of natural language processing where you don't actually need to be, you know, writing all the code yourself. We end up in a situation that we had with mechanical engineering. You know, you do not need your mechanic who's fixing your car, who's dealing with the day-to-day -day maintenance to have a mechanical engineering degree. But you probably want someone who had one designing the car. You know, <laughs> this is the direction that we're moving with a lot of technologies. Yeah. There's the opportunity to move some of this training from the university to the vocational edu education and training sector. And that frees up some space, you know, to, to do really exciting multidisciplinary degrees that are highly academic and they require research and they require you know, cutting edge thinking, some of the things that we are now more familiar with, they can become digital trades. So that's something that we're looking at and how do we boost that workforce and, you know, keep universities open for that work. Yeah, it's got, that's a great point because actually thinking about the super janitor, you know, he doesn't have to be a lift specialist or a, um, a HVAC specialist, but I probably want him to have um, electrical, uh, a certification in electrical uh, uh, work and maybe a plumbing certification as well. And, but then all the rest he can learn on the spot. So. If they can change those light globes, they've got a job. Um, <laughs> um, I, there's great self-interest in, in that question. As a national academy, we, we think a lot about how we celebrate and reward excellence in science and how we configure scientific disciplines um, uh, through our fellowship and other mechanisms uh, to meet the needs of the future. And obviously interdisciplinarity is important, multidisciplinarity, but um, I think you're right, you know, the, the, the kind of siloed approach is really not going to be the best way to support the future workforce. Actually, that in itself, the silo is a great is a great segue. Um, Scarlett, I'm going to go back to you because I think you guys have the wonderful task um, as Tech Council to corral everybody, um, and you guys are, are doing a phenomenal job um, in advocating for the industry with government. Um, I, I would just love to touch on, you know, what what are some of the elements that you're focused on, and what are some of the conversations that you guys are having um, with government today to, I guess, encourage women in STEM, but diversity in the workforce more broadly? Yeah, thanks, Ebony. It's a great question. Um, as with any of the topics that we've covered today, they can't be solved only by industry, they can't be solved only by academia, and they cannot be solved only by government. So it's critical that we do come together and get a shared understanding of the reality of, of the things that we're talking about. And, you know, 5G and 6G is a great example. If we don't have government understanding the need for these critical technologies mm. now, we risk missing out later in the Australian economy being able to implement some of these technologies. And we're even seeing that now with generative AI. It's the companies that have got data sorted out, you know, from, you know, clean data or data that's stored yeah. functionally, 
that they can use securely, that they're now able to quickly implement AI. So if we don't have this underlying infrastructure, we won't be able to quickly implement uh, these sorts of interconnected reality technologies when they become commercial or when they become mainstream in enterprise. So a lot of our work is making sure that you know, those three sectors that we're on the same page and we're swimming you know, in the same direction to solve the same problems. Um, and then again, we have a strong focus on workforce. And we know that a lot of the, the problems that we see in diversity in our workforce are actually symptoms of a root cause, which is poor design, poor system design. We didn't design our education and employment systems thinking about how do we create a diverse workforce. We let them grow up organically over time. You know, originally computing was a women's job. You know, and computers were people, and there were people who crunched numbers. And then we began advertising technology to boys um, in the 80s, in the 70s even. Um, and then we've seen the flow-on effect of that. So we really need to go back to those root causes, and we're doing that looking at programs like virtual work experience. How do we demonstrate to young women that women can be really successful in these careers, in creative roles, but also in highly technical engineering roles like I come from? Um, and then we're taking that even further through how do we do work integrated learning that works for higher education and it works for vocational education and how when we build these new systems do we build them with inclusivity as a design principle and not a bolt-on afterthought so that's a lot of the work that the tech council is focused on wonderful and um, music to our ears on the um, 5g awareness and 6g and i think we've all spoken about before it's not here for us as consumers to download cat videos faster um, it is absolutely here for industry so i might just ask one one last question i know we're coming close to time um, and it is on that theme around 5 5g and emerging technology i mean Leslie, what are you seeing as some of the obstacles and challenges for companies adopting these types of technologies into their business? I think the, the largest one is really awareness. Um, you know, we're all busy. We're all busy doing our jobs. And so, um, you know, back when the internet first really came up, um, I did not get into it at all because I was busy and and it wasn't until I was actually forced to use email at work probably 1997 or so that 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 I finally started getting into the internet um, and so one of the things that I repeatedly see in this kind of augmented reality and virtual reality world even though it's delivering these spectacular business benefits um, everybody's busy doing the job that they already have and getting people to look up and take the time and see what's out there and see what could actually improve their company's productivity that that's a big ask of people and and there needs to be a pretty big carrot um hanging there to get people to do that so i'm trying to be a big carrot <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, in the metaverse i can be a really big carrot so that's a whole other story <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, and I think, look, just, you know, I will say, you know, we talk about an ecosystem, we talk about it a lot, and I think what we've seen here today is we have that exact ecosystem, um, and, it, and it applies not just to the adoption of technology, regardless of whether it's 5G, whether it's fixed, doesn't matter. Um, the same applies when we start thinking about, you know, diversity um, in our industry, and when, in particular when we start thinking about um, women in STEM. So I would very much just like to um, thank our panellists um, today. Um, for before you wrap up, could I give a shout out to Nokia? I'm sure you won't say <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Not really, I, I would like to um, recognise Nokia because um, one of the reasons we're here today is I mentioned earlier that um, we have the Women in STEM Decatur Plan, the 10-year strategy to achieve gender equity, and there are 44 organisations across this country who are champions of that decadal plan, which means they've aligned all their gender equity initiatives um, with the opportunities that are presented in the decadal plan. There are six key opportunities. And it means we're pushing in the same direction. So that's people from industry, from academia, uh, from schools, parents, a range of people. There are 44 organisations and one of them is Nokia. Um, and through a range of, there, there they are, um, through a range of, somebody heard me in the box up there, um, through a range of initiatives, uh, they're really seeking to improve gender equity in their organisation. So I, I just really did want to applaud that. And if you're from an organisation who ought to be um, aligning your gender equity initiatives uh, with the Decadal Plan, please do speak with us. Um, we'd love to add you to the list. But it is a really powerful way for all of us to push in the same direction. So thank you, Naki, for, for all you're doing.
Uh, and, and, you know, a big thank you um, to yourself um, and the team for helping us do this today. As I said, I think these conversations, we can only progress forward um, by having these types of conversations. And I think most importantly, providing such a wonderful um, panellist and, and leaders in the industry that are female, um, that is one big thing that we know that can absolutely encourage more females in this industry. We, you know, we want to see, we want to see um, what we can be when we start um, thinking about our careers in the industry. So again, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming today. Please put your hand together for Leslie as well as our lovely panellists today. Actually, even though we're done here, I'd just like to uh, throw in a last minute uh, uh, note. In, um, in Finland, in the Finnish language, um, there, is, there are no separate words for he and she. It's just han is that person who's not with us right now that we're talking about. And, um, and I truly, I mean, I lived in Finland for 11 years, and uh, I truly believe that the fact that there is no distinction in the language is a huge part of why in Finland, um, it's a majority female MPs. Finland has had a Finnish president and a Finnish prime minister. Um, and, um, and it's all very equitable when it comes to childcare. I mean, it's, it's, the language base has a lot to do with the way that we think in ways that we don't even understand. And, um, and you know, a lot of, um, in terms of diversity, seeing that it's possible, both in terms of modeling for young women and, and you know, anybody, knowing that it's possible is a big part of it. Knowing that when you actually erase gender even noticing which gender somebody, it's very funny, my Finnish husband, he quite often in English, he'll say something like, oh, you know, Barack Obama, she, I mean, because he's, he's genuinely not thinking about the gender when he's talking about somebody because his language doesn't require him to. And so knowing that it is possible, that actually makes it easier for me to see that, first of all, we have to get rid of gendered thinking in our own minds. And, you know, I don't, I don't, go so far as to say we need a non-gendered pronoun, but, uh, um, you know, um, just kind of, it helps me kind of stop and think about, there, there are ways in which I think of men and women differently, just in myself, that's really encouraged by language, and just kind of be aware of that and try to move beyond it in your own mind, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs>